I love the story of Christmas. And we opened the service this morning with the song, Joy to the World. You should know that this song, Joy to the World, was not really written as a Christmas song. Um, do some research on that sometime. It was, it was an all, but we would have relegated it to uh, Christmas, and I think unfortunately so. And then we put that little mashup in there of Our God Saves, because that's what Christmas is all about. It's about God's salvation uh, coming down for us and, and taking care of us. That's what Christmas is really about. What's amazing to me, and, and i got to be honest with you, I am one of those guys I absolutely love Christmas. Had I been through, uh, you know, if my background was the same as Dave's, I understand Dave, and uh, I understand uh, uh, his, his perspective on things. I, I'm kind of the opposite of that, is that, that there is so much joy during the Christmas season uh, for me that it is a wonderful thing. And I can't imagine, and it amazes me why we spend so much, why, why people spend so much time trying to take the joy uh, out of Christmas. I mean, maybe we think of it's, it's a, Christmas is, is a battle of who can have the best, uh, best Christmas lights. Um, I think I've told you my philosophy of Christmas lights is it really doesn't matter whether you have Christmas lights on your house or not, you can't see them. Uh, what you want to do is make sure you live close to somebody who has really good Christmas lights. Uh, that's what that's all about. Um, and, and, uh, but sometimes it, it, it turns into a battle, best lights, uh, give the best gifts, uh, so to speak. And so we go way above and beyond where we should be, I think, a lot of times uh, in our lives. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, my good friend Mike McCann always does some really great articles about Christmas at Christmas time. And uh, this year, um, he began one of his articles with... Um, with the words, I suggest we lay off the innkeeper. Okay, now I want to read you what happened as a result of my, uh, the article went on, he made some really nice points, uh, you know, uh, about God taking care of, thing and, uh, care of things, and it was really under God's control anyway. But the doctrinal watchdogs went crazy. Okay, for example, and, and I, copied this, I copied this off of Facebook. It says this, and I happen to know this particular individual. It says, there's no innkeeper in the Bible. Probably was no room in the main house of a relative. No stable mentioned either, or animals. Another guy weighs in, another guy who happened to know, and says this. He says, the inn was actually a guest house most likely at a home of relatives on property owned by Boaz, Ruth's husband. I've got to be honest with you. 40 years of ministry, that's the first time I've heard this one. Um, there is so much history, and then he goes on to say, there is so much historical nonsense in the Western fairy tale we call Christmas. And I mean almost every detail is wrong. And I'm thinking, so is your observation, pal. Um, and then, and then a third guy weighs in, and he says, actually, I believe there was no inn. Doesn't matter if the Bible says big, because there was no room in the inn. Uh, it doesn't matter. When was the last time you went back home to visit all your family, mom, dad, aunts, uncles, and grandparents, cousins, and stayed at a Motel 6? Then it goes on to say, uh, the word translated as inn is Cataluma, and it's the same word translated, and goes on and on and on. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's one of the few times I, I very rarely weigh in uh, to those things. Um, but I did weigh in this time, and I said, uh, uh, all nitpicking aside, um, you wrote a really great article with some really great points. And then I put, maybe this is how we take the joy out of Christmas. Because I think a lot of times, and I suppose in, in you know, I, I suppose I ought to let up off of those guys in some ways because they're probably really well-meaning, but we have so many people who are just, they are just absolute doctrinal watchdogs, and they want to make sure everything, and, and in my opinion, you're straining, you're straining the, the gnat and you're swallowing the camel. And we have to be careful about that. Um, there are things that give me real joy at Christmas. Um, for example, I, I think I've shared probably most of these things uh, with you over the years. Um, the star on Namaqua Hill that lights up every Christmas season. That, I, I, I love seeing that star. I remember several years ago when, there was a, when it was going to go defunct 
and uh, a young man by the name of Max Morey took it on himself as his Eagle Scout project uh, to make sure that that light stayed lit. That's one of the things that I look forward to um, every year. Uh, another one of the things that I look for is the nativity, that great big nativity that uh, D. Decker Studios put out uh, in the corner of Taft and 8th uh, here in Loveland. Uh, if you haven't driven by that, that corner of Taft and 8th, I, I encourage you to do that sometime. Uh, it's really great when it's at nighttime and the snow's falling. Um, but even, even so, it's, it's, uh, it's a great thing. One of the things I used to look for was the guy on Wilson Avenue who used to put out about 350,000 plastic things in his backyard. Now, I don't know what happened, uh, but he's gone. And uh, so we don't have, I don't have that anymore, but it was replaced recently by this. This is Cranberry Sprite. Now, Cranberry Sprite only comes out during the holidays. And I had chicken a few weeks ago, so I think I can have... And some of you are probably saying, well, you know what, Lane, that's not diet, and you could use diet, pal. I don't even know if they make it in diet. But let me tell you something. If you haven't tried that Cranberry Sprite, you ought to. And, and uh, it, it, it came out in the grocery stores, uh, I don't know, sometime a week or so after Thanksgiving was, was when I first found it. You think I'm going to tell you where my <laughs> private stash is? <laughs> Taft and Eisenhower, uh, the uh, Safeway there. Um, and plug for those guys. I don't mind. It's a great grocery store. Um, anyway, Thank you. you are welcome. I mean, <laughs> if you don't get anything else this morning, get this. You can find strawberry. <laughs> oh, man. God. I, yeah, that's the first time. That is the first time in 28 years she's written something down that I said. <laughs> Probably the last. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, I love, I love the Christmas season and, and the joy of Christmas season. Most of you probably don't know this, but uh, years and years ago, my mom got me started, and she gave me some of those, uh, you know, those little houses that are about this tall, and you make up a. And so I have an area in my house. It, it's not a large area; it's about four feet by about I don't know, two and a half feet. And I have six of those houses, and little people, and a little train that goes around this. Uh, whole kind of thing, and, and you know what, sometime if you want to come by my house and, and see that, feel free to do so, just bring Cranberry Sprite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got a couple of new things that, uh, this, this year that uh, uh, give me a whole lot of joy. Um, for example, this, this uh, picture here was done by my daughter, and uh, if you can see the outline of the nativity scene and and it's filled in with all kinds of words from Christmas songs. And the enormous amount of time and creativity that, that uh, Hannah did, um, that, was, that, was just, uh, that just meant an awful lot to me. Um, last week, uh, I get to share, you know, be able to share in preaching this Christmas series. I get to share in it with my son, uh, to have my son uh, be a part of this whole process. Those are our new joys for this year, um, but they are they are absolutely incredible joys. I, I mean, I love my decorations at my house, and I have a whole lot of them, but I have some. And uh, this year, I got tired of killing fish, and so I gave my fish tank a rest and put a nativity scene uh, back where the dead fish used to be. <laughs> and uh, um, it's a wonderful, it, it's a very special nativity set to me. It's one that... Uh, my mother hand-finished the pieces on the nativity set. And those kind of things uh, bring me uh, a whole lot of joy. This year, I bought a new nativity set. And it's a Peanuts uh, nativity set. Now, I realize that that is not politically correct anymore to have Peanuts and Charlie Brown Christmas and all that. I don't care. Um, I, 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 love, those, I love those kinds of things. Um, 
I, I, I don't, you know, and, and even that, that kind of thing where we question those and all the things that have come up this season. I don't, I don't know why we do so much to try to, uh, to take the, um, the joy out of the Christmas story. Um, I was reading a whole bunch of things, of course, this last couple of weeks because I had two weeks to prepare. And I came across this article, um, and the article was called Seven Steps to Putting the Joy Back in Christmas. And I thought, ah, you know, that, that is, is really good, that now we have seven steps to putting the joy back in Christmas. i, I got to be honest with you, I stopped reading when step number two was lower your expectations. I mean, for me, Christmas is all about expectations. It's all about the great things that can happen and do. Uh, I mean, the expectation of Christ, the expectation of an openness to Jesus at this time uh, is just an incredible thing. Uh, before we go much farther, let's, let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for this time here, and, and I come asking um, a couple of things. I ask, number one, that you would forgive me for uh, my multitude of sins and that you would use me in spite of that. Father, I pray that uh, as, I, as I would speak from your word this morning, that they would be words of hope and encouragement that would bring joy to my friends today. Help us to see who you are maybe a little bit more clearly today because we've been here with you. I just thank you for this opportunity in the name of Jesus. Amen. The last candle, the, the uh, rose pink colored candle that we lit this morning is called it's it's the joy candle and it's also called as I told you earlier it's the shepherd's candle and it reminds us of those words and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night and lo an angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. And he goes on to tell them, For unto you is born this day in the, in the city of David as a Savior, and his name is Christ the Lord. One of my favorite, favorite uh, Christmas songs is the song, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember, Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from sin and shame when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. I love that. You see, the truth of Christmas, the real truth of Christmas, has always been and will always be about joy. The precursor to the whole Christmas story is the birth of Jesus' cousin, I suppose the best way to say it, who we know as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, the, the whole story of, of his coming unfolds in the first chapter of the book of Luke, and the angel is talking about John the Baptist, and the angel says this, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. That's where it all starts. That's a precursor uh, to the whole thing. When Jesus and John meet for the first time, and the first time that Jesus and John meet, neither one of them is out of the womb yet. I think that says something to us is that the Bible pictures this as a meeting between two individuals. And the Bible tells us about that meeting. If we were to go on in that first chapter of Luke a little bit farther, um, this is what happens. says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby, this is Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, talking to her. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. He was joyful. This was his, his encounter. He knew what was happening. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world. That beautiful piece then that follows it is what we know as the Magnificat, where Mary is talking about all the wonderful things uh, that happened to her. We just go down just a few more verses uh, in Luke 1. And it says, and Mary says, and my spirit 
rejoices, rejoices in God my Savior. Christmas has always been about joy. And there's a good reason for that. Got a couple things to tell you this morning, and the first is this, is that joy is found in the presence of God. Joy is found in the presence of God. I guarantee that is that when we come into the presence of God, there is great joy that fills us. And there is no greater presence of God than to have him move physically into our world. I love the way that the message paraphrases the, the first chapter of, of John's gospel. And, and in, right in the middle of that, that little discourse about the word becoming flesh, um, Peterson, tra- Peterson gives us the words, and the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. There is no greater joy than the presence of God. One of the things that I, that I did, did, did find in uh, that little article that I referred to uh, earlier, this, one of the seven ways to experience the often elusive joy of Christmas, um, I, I, I can't remember which number it was. I think it was number five, maybe number six anyway. But number five was if you want to experience uh, the uh, joy of Christmas, you need to go to church. Now, here is what she said about that. She said, if you're from a Christian faith background and used to go to church on Christmas but haven't for a while, consider going back. The holidays will most likely feel empty for you without it since the spiritual experience and significance is part of your heritage. If you aren't from a Christian faith background, consider visiting your place of worship or simply taking extra time to meditate, think, or pray. Hope and peace aren't items that can be tied with a bow and placed under your tree. They're spiritual, and I like this part, they're spiritual and emotional experiences that you need to make space for in your heart. Find your way back to church. Maybe that's why some people, maybe that's why a lot of people sometimes, is that, uh, you know, we don't experience that a whole lot around here. Um, but in, in a lot of places, you will find some people make their way back to church at least once or twice um, during the Christmas season, and maybe they're looking for that elusive joy. Maybe they're trying to find that. And I think that's a good thing, and if that's so, I hope they really do find the presence of God because joy is found in the presence of God. He promised to be here. He promised to be here, and I choose to believe what he said. I think it's an important thing, because he has said that he would show up. And I think for us, it's important for us not to belittle people. And it's really easy for people to say, ah, there comes those people. They just come to church on Christmas and Easter, as if somehow we we were uh, so much more spiritual than they are. But I think rather than belittling that action, we welcome those people and help them find the joy that they may be missing in their lives because maybe that's what they're looking for, that joy that Jesus can bring. And maybe they feel a little bit of it, and we need to give them, we need to give them the good news of Christ, which leads us to great joy. I mean, we don't know what they're going through. Maybe they're struggling with a whole lot of things and they need that joy in their lives. And we need to help them find that. Because the truth of the matter is is that joy is found in the presence of God. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Nehemiah, or or the psalmist, the, the prophet Nehemiah would say it this way. He'd say, for the joy of the Lord, he would say, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I think that leads me to the second thing that I want to talk about real briefly here this morning, and that's the joy flows from a thankful heart. I mean, it, it comes out of us. Joy flows out of us because our heart is thankful. Not only is joy found in God's presence, but it flows out of us when our heart is, is joyful. The psalmist would say this in Psalm 
100 verse 4, he would say, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Kim Solomon, the author, writes this about that particular verse. She writes, the psalmist tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and to enter his courts with praise. But when you're weary and tired, running from one event to the next, thankfulness can get lost in the shuffle. If this sounds familiar, take some time daily to daily record those things for which you are grateful. Whether you do this on your own or as a family, you will find yourself overwhelmed with gratitude and filled with joy that will extend beyond the season. Your failures will no longer seem important. Thanksgiving should not be just a holiday before Christmas, but rather a way of life. Spend time thanking God for his many blessings this Advent and throughout the year that follows. And to be honest with you, I, I, I identify with a lot of that, especially when she says is that... Um, that we can lose it when we've got so many things going on in, in our lives. Um, and I, I think I would add is that it's very easy, to, and I think probably with her complete permission, uh, add, add that when we're going too fast, is that it's very easy for us to lose joy, not just thankfulness, but we can lose joy as well, and we can, it gets lost in the shuffle. I mean, people say, that people tend to have a happier disposition during the Christmas holiday season. Uh, that is until you take their parking space. <laughs> or you get the last gift that they wanted. I mean, emotions seem to be running so high in both directions at this particular point uh, of time. Um, but I think my advice would be very simply this, is slow down. Slow down on the stuff that matters. Focus on the stuff that matters. This year, um, I added some decorations to my Christmas, our family Christmas tree. Now those decorations that I added, mind you, are the only things that I did to that tree. Um, because I know that Sam and uh, Hannah and, and Jared, they, they spent a lot of time and, and they got the tree just right and they do such a great job. But this year I, I bought some of those, uh, they're, they're, I don't know, about five inches and, and they're candles that are, are battery powered. And maybe some of you were worrying about me thinking uh, the guy's putting candles on his Christmas tree, he's going to burn his house down. Uh, no, that's not what's... They're, they're, they're battery-powered. They have a little LED light on them. And uh, um, at the end of the day, pretty much every day, no matter what time it is, I'll, I'll take just, just a few minutes. And I'll sit there in the middle of my family room. And I'll flip on the fireplace. And I'll look at the, the lights and the decorations on the tree and all the things that are on the mantle and the candles and, and off to my right is, is the, uh, the set uh, that I talked to you about. And it's a time when I just kind of, I, I, I just sit down and slow down. And I feel peace and I feel joy in that, in that morning. And, and I, I, I love it when all the decorations are up and I, I feel better about the whole thing. And you may think I'm crazy, but the truth is, is I have science on my side. I read several articles this year that said people who get their decorations up early tend to be happier and healthier. Not just one study, but, but there were several studies that were saying the same thing. And so my conclusion is, I'm just leaving it up. <laughs> Got it set, now I, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it there and, and I'll, have, I'll have joy. Um, but I, I am, I am I'm extremely thankful for this season that we have. I, I am thankful for everything that is Christmas. And you know what, if you want to and you're listening to me and maybe have a critical ear and you're thinking, 
Yeah, but there's so much weird stuff about... You know what? Go ahead and join Mike's little band of doctrinal watchdogs if you want. I mean, go ahead and tell me how Jesus couldn't have been born on December. I understand that. Go ahead and tell me, well, you know those wise men you got in your nativity scene? They weren't really there uh, for the nativity. I understand that. You can go ahead and tell me how Christmas trees come from the Druids. I don't even know the Druids. Don't even care about the Druids. I know what the real meaning of Christmas is. I know about the incarnation of Christ. And if any of these things add joy to my celebration, I want to tell you this, you can call me whatever you want to call me, but I will celebrate. And I will celebrate my Jesus. Because he has been born for me. I love the story of Christmas. And it's because of this story of Jesus coming to earth, being born of a virgin, being willing to give his life for me. That's a true story. That's a true story, and it gives me joy, and it gives me hope. This past week, I sat with a family who's searching for joy this Christmas season. It's a mother of 17-year-old son struggling for her life because her body is, is being ravaged by cancer. And the earthly hope that they have is not that strong. But they allowed me into their home this week. And I talked. And I, I continued to tell them the story of Jesus, the good news, the real story of Jesus. Not what this world has done with Jesus and this, that, and everything, but the story of the Jesus who came so that we would have life forever. And you know what? I, I know that I got nothing to offer this family. Not myself. I'm nothing. And my heart breaks for them. And I'm humbled that they allowed me to talk with them. As a matter of fact, they've even asked me to come back and continue to share. And we don't know. We don't, we don't know what physical, the earthly outcome of this whole thing is. I do know that this is a young lady who many years back I, I baptized her. And I know that she knows Jesus. And she just wants to share Jesus with those who are close to her, around her. And I want to share with them the Jesus who, who can give comfort and give joy even in the midst of our pain and our hurt and our anger and our doubt. I'm no, but I have, I have nothing to offer them except I have everything. I have a Jesus who loves. He is the Lord of love. And he is the Lord of life. And he is the Lord of light in a time of darkness. He is a Jesus who brings us joy if we'll but see him. And for us, for us, this joy begins at the manger. And Father, I pray this morning. I pray that your joy would permeate our hearts and lives in so many different ways. For you are so good to us and, and you are so loving and that love endures forever. I pray this week that you would help us to unpack some of that joy. That we would celebrate in the midst of those who do everything that they can to try to take the celebration of joy away from us. Don't let it happen. And Father... Grant that our joy would be born in you. Because you, in your presence, you are joy. 
Help us this day to see you. In the name of Christ.